you're coming up on a year in the role. Yes. Uh, is that has that does that hit you that it's it's already been a year? How has that felt to you? It, it, it went by pretty fast. Yeah. What would you say you're most proud of so far as superintendent in um, Chicago? Uh, my department members, um, the uh, way that uh, the officers responded during the DNC, um, and I've said it over and over again, I could not be more proud of how um, uh, the Chicago Police Department uh, responded um, to a situation where most people expected them to fail. Um, they, uh, they performed um, in uh, exemplary fashion, and I just can't say enough about the work they did. Is there anything you took from the DNC that you learned that you can apply to the more day-to-day -day policing, maybe what you did yourself? Anything that you took from that experience that you, you hope to apply to how CPD conducts itself every single day? Absolutely. Uh, number one, the focus on the wellness of our officers. Um, uh, two, preparedness, um, training, um, constant training. Um, three, the leadership aspect, the top-down effect, uh, making sure uh, that our leadership uh, is in the field, um, helping our officers, making sure that our officers uh, have the tools that they need to succeed. What's one or two things that you wish you could have done better in the last year? Uh, you know, there's always things uh, that uh, could be done better. Um, uh, I want to be a better communicator, make sure that uh, the when we're talking to the public or we're trying to get a message out, that people have a clear understanding of what it is uh, they should expect from us, the things we should expect from them, and then just have those open lines of communication um, with our community members uh, and the citizens of the city to, to make sure that we uh, build those partnerships. If I gave Larry Snelling a magic wand and I said, hey, you can fix one thing with this as it relates to policing, public safety, What's, what's one of the things you'd fix right away if you had that kind of power? You know, violent crime. Um, violent crime uh, affects everyone in the city. Um, rather, it affects you directly or indirectly. Um, it's traumatizing. Um, obviously, it's traumatizing for the, the, the victims, but it's also traumatizing for the family members of those victims. And uh, that trauma is across the board. So. If there's something that, that I, I could wave a magic wand and put an end to right now, it would be violent crime. The numbers are trending in the right direction, some faster, some not so much as it relates to the type of crime that's being committed. This is according to the CPD dashboard. How would you characterize how you're handling crime in the city, especially violent crime? You know, uh, the focus is on violent crime right now, but um, the focus is also on certain property crimes like uh, uh, vehicle thefts and vehicular hijackings because we know those vehicles are being stolen and, be and they're being used in secondary crimes that uh, lead to uh, violent attacks, uh, robbery, shootings, things of that nature. Um, what I would say is, is that our officers are focused. Uh, morale is up. Our officers are doing a great job out there of, uh, focusing on the top 35 beats, our most violent beats throughout the city. Um, and having the focus on uh, that, uh, those particular beats allows us to be proactive um, to keep uh, some of that crime down. So our officers are working really hard. Um, we have to continue to, to move in that direction. We've got a lot of work to do. So we have to keep the morale up, but we also have to keep our officers trained. And our leadership has to be out there to make sure that uh, they're working toward the expectations of the officers there's an accountability factor there, but there's also a leadership factor that are, that's going to help our officers move in the right direction. Let's talk about morale as it relates to staffing especially. I know you hear often when, when the days off get canceled, the vacations get canceled and stuff like that, you know that it has an effect on the officers, of course. Where is the department with staffing, especially as it relates to overtime? Well, here, again, as, as we know, and this just doesn't affect the Chicago Police Department, it affects police departments across the entire nation. Um, we're short officers. However, um, we plan around those things. Uh, we do the best that we can right now with what we have. It would be great uh, to have uh, officers and have them fully staffed. Um, but that's not the case right now. The reality is we're short uh, with the number of officers that we have right now, but we continue to fill those gaps where we can 
do we utilize overtime? We try to use it judiciously, right? We don't want to overtax our officers. We want them to have time with their families because we, we have to be aware that uh, officers uh, could suffer um, on the wellness front. And we want to make sure that our officers are well so that we're putting the best uh, well-trained um, officer out into the field to get the best results. And I, I know you've only had the job for a few months last year. Last year, Chicago police hit an, uh, a record amount of overtime. Are we going to look at another record this year? I know it was a busy year with a lot of stuff going on in the city, but the, yes. the taxpayers have the right to know. Well, I can tell you, you won't, you won't see a record number of overtime. Um, you won't hit the, we won't go above the number that we saw last year? No, no. I, and I, I can tell you that up front. Um, it, now, to tell you that, that we haven't used o o overtime or utilized overtime, that, that wouldn't be true. Um, we've had to use overtime. Uh, when you look at the number of events that have occurred uh, throughout the summer, NASCAR, we've, uh, you know, uh, parades, uh, the air and water show, um, and a little thing called the DNC. So, um, yes, we've used it, but again, we've used it judiciously. Um I know you've talked a lot about ShotSpotter. How do you feel going into now we are, well, how should Chicago go forward using technology that is ShotSpotter, like ShotSpotter? What's your opinion on how to move forward after all the fighting we've had, especially in the city council? Listen, my, my opinion right now is not just an opinion. Here are the facts. The, the, fact, the fact that is that our police officers are out there every single day, no matter what. Technology, no technology. If the technology goes down, our officers still have to go to jobs. They still have to respond to violent crimes. And we still have to be out there to protect our citizens and our neighborhoods. And that's what we're going to do. The, 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 the fights, the arguments around ShotSpotter, I'm, I'm done with it. Uh, you know, I'm not focused on that right now because um, whatever the outcome, our officers are going to continue to do the great work that they're doing out there. And listen, we, we want people to uh, call 911. We want to make sure that if they hear shots, call 911, and we get that dispatched out to our officers as quickly as possible, and we get our officers to those jobs. If ShotSpotter or a similar technology does not continue to be used in the city, how would you like that money to be used? best for the department? Well, I'll put it to you like this. I, I don't get into the, the financial part of it because that's outside of my wheelhouse. Um, what I can say is this, where we can uh, provide our officers with more resources uh, to get the job done and whatever those resources are, I'm willing to do that, especially in training. We, we the, the resources in training, it, it, when you see the response of the Democratic National Convention, that was a result of preparation. It was a result of training. And when we can provide our officers with that level of training and then hold everyone's feet to the fire to that training from the officers all the way up to the top, you, can, you see the positive uh, outcomes that we can have as a result of that. Uh, I want to ask about um, Chicago Police does not have a great record of solving hit and run cases. Uh, even those that result in the death of a person. Um, in 2021, I know you weren't the superintendent at that time, we're looking at 0.3% arrest rate for hit and runs, 2.3% if it's a case where someone is killed. NYPD, just as a comparison, 25% arrest rate. Mm -hmm. How do those numbers sit with you and, and what can you do to fix that? Obviously, anytime we're behind the eight ball on something, it doesn't sit well with me. And, and when we know that there are things that we can do better, we need to focus on those things. Now, one of the things that I will say is that um, we have LPR readers out there now. Anytime that we see, we hear about a robbery, um, a stolen vehicle, a vehicle hijacking, we look at those LPRs. So if, if there's a hit and run, um, our ATC room uh, can follow uh, vehicles uh, from location to location, and if we have LPR hits on those license plates, it's going to help us follow up um, in uh, not only identifying um, the vehicle, the owner of the vehicle, possibly the driver, but it's going to help us follow up uh, with, with an arrest situation. We've sat down with uh, many victims' families who, um, you know, after that initial contact with the detective, they feel that um, sometimes their case gets ignored, put on the back burner, there's no contact for months. 
what should detectives do? Because it, it, is that part of their training to, to let the communication lapse for months at a time? What, what, what is the best practice? Well, this is, this is why we've created our FLO program, our family liaison program. So our family liaisons are within the detective division and they keep in close contact with family members to let them know um, the status of the investigation. Um, look, you know, as a person who maybe has lost a loved one or, or have been victimized themselves, you want to know the status of your case, and we understand that. So with victim, we're, as we continue to build victim services and bring in uh, more civilians to be the conduit between the police um, uh, and those uh, uh, people who have been victimized, um, that's going to help. But our family liaison program has been doing great things right now with helping to build those relationships. And we've seen some positive uh, effects of it. We're about a year into the Safety Act, uh, changes to all the pretrial release. What's your opinion on how that's gone so far? You know, anything that or any legislation can be imp improved upon. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not here to criticize the Safety Act. Our officers are working around everything. And anytime you have changes uh, in legislation like that, our officers have to be educated around it. And as long as they're educated around it, um, they've been very effective in getting the job done. Our detectives have been very effective at uh, solving crimes and uh, closing out uh, a lot of cases, especially when it comes to violent crime. So. Just the education of it, being aware of those things uh, that are going to be helpful uh, to us to, to uh, solve these crimes, um, that's the most effective way to deal with it, just to make sure that our officers and our department as a whole, uh, they're educated on it. When you hear a case, uh, and I'm sure you hear about it from time to time, something coming across your desk, where a person who was out released for a, for a violent crime was just you know, suspicion of a violent crime, and then they get reapprehended by your officers. Do you think that happens too much? Do you think it's about what it should be? I mean, that's what a lot of people have been saying. Why, why are somebody who should have been behind bars, maybe under the old system, uh, how are they out on the street accused of committing another violent crime? Well, we have to look at specific cases, but as a whole, if we're talking about someone that we know is a a multiple time violent offender, it is very frustrating to see that person back on the street, especially when we know that uh, we have people who are on electronic monitoring um, and they're still committing crimes while they're on electronic monitoring. Um, it, this isn't to point the finger at anybody, but except for the offender, right? But when we know that we have someone who has committed multiple acts, multiple violent crimes, and uh, this repeat offender continues to offend in this manner, there has to be a point where we look at this person and say that this person is a danger to society. He or she should be held you know, until uh, uh, their trial is done. Uh, the Cook County Sheriff says uh, that Trende Aragua, the Venezuelan gang, does have a confirmed presence in Chicago. Um, would, would you confirm their presence? I'm, I'm sorry, what? what Trende Aragua. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the, the, okay. the gang title. Where did you say you got the information? Uh, the Cook County Sheriff's Office obtained, uh, has some documents confirming the presence of Trende Aragua in Chicago. Uh, intelligence units from the Cook County Sheriff's Office are concerned about their operations here. What is your visibility uh, and concern related to Trende Aragua? What I can tell you is that we do have intel around that. Um, and we're keeping an eye on not only uh, the possibility of an operation uh, from this particular group, but any group that would engage in any type of violent activity um, or any type of violent crimes. Uh, um, you know, this is one year anniversary. Of I, I understand. You're going to explore this war of stuff. There's a lot of things to talk about in the city of Chicago. We got some time left. Um, so in, uh, in Denver, special units have been created to look at this gang. Is there any sort of plans as of right now to... No, here's what I can tell you right now. Um, the plans that we have are around activity, right? We don't necessarily look at titles. What we're looking at is the activity around people 
-hmm. who are committing violent crimes. Uh, we're looking at crime sprees, criminal activity, um, especially if it's organized. And if we see organized crime, if we see uh, uh, crime trends, especially those of a violent nature, we work around those things. We, that's why we have the Bureau of Counterterrorism. We get intel and we, we come up with plans to work uh, to, to keep that type of crime down. There was a, a big celebration when an insider was hired to become the next CPD superintendent. A lot of people said, we gotta have somebody from inside the system. How do you think that's helped you in year one to be able to build trust within that department? Well, you know, just having an, an, an understanding of the city as a whole, not only the city, but the department, right? You know the inner workings of the department. Um, you have a relationship with the members. Um, and you, you've seen over the years, I've seen over the years, some of the issues um, that have affected our members. Um, and when you know what those issues are, you can address those issues. Um, it is very difficult uh, for people to come from the outside into a, a department because it, you, you have a lot to learn. So, um, and it's not that I believe that someone from the outside could do the job, but there's a lot to learn. Um, along with that, there's a trust factor with people within the department who feel that, hey, we, you know, there's someone who knows and understands uh, the department and its members. And um, it's, it's really helpful to know that and have a clear understanding. So you know what address, uh, uh, issues to address the moment that you walk in. When you think about officer wellness, um, what still needs to be done to really uh, reach out to an officer that may need help? What, what's the best practices that, that you still want to preach within this department to, to make it a healthy and functional department? The, the one thing uh, that most people don't know is, is um, the things that officers see on a daily basis that would affect any human being. Um, and we expect those officers to go home, think about those things at night, return to work, and do it all over again. What we have to do is make sure that our officers are comfortable enough that when something has affected them at work to reach out and ask for help. Um, there's nothing wrong with going to see someone and talking it out. It doesn't make you weak. As a matter of fact, it shows strength that you want to go and get that help and make yourself better. But at the same time, on a supervisory le uh, level, our partners have to recognize if there's a change in my behavior uh, to call me out and, and to say, hey, listen, I think you probably need to go get some help. Now, from a department standpoint, from a leadership standpoint, we have to make sure that our officers are being provided with the best possible resources to make sure that they're well, that they're getting rest, and we have to make sure that we're not overtaxing them. What are the big points of emphasis now going into year two? I mean, this, you're, you're entering your 29th or 30th year with CPD now, so you, you, but you've only had a year in this job specifically. What's the big points of emphasis in this second year? The big points of emphasis is to take a bunch of the successes that we've had this year that we applied to large-scale events and now to apply that um, on a neighborhood level. Um, we're looking at the effectiveness of preparedness, training. We want to use that so that our officers now are developing relationships, better relationships with people in the community, getting to know people, becoming a part of the community in a way where we all feel like partners. This, these are the things that's going to help us get to the bottom of violent crime. Getting to know people, developing that trust, having open communication. And when we have that, we're, we're more likely to have people uh, provide information that's going to help us solve crimes, uh, uh, apprehend people who are violent offenders. And we, we're starting to see that. Um, we're starting to build that trust. We still have a long way to go. We see the crime numbers coming down and we still have a long way to go. So now what we need to do is double down on those efforts and make sure that we continue to push things in the right direction. Uh, Governor Pritzker said he may want to put Chicago's name in for the 2028 DNC. <laughs> Who knows what 2028 is going to look like for, for anybody. Would you welcome if the DNC were back here, if you're still in the superintendent role in 2028, would you welcome the DNC back to Chicago? I would absolutely welcome it for the next superintendent. <laughs> <laughs> you won't be here, you're thinking, at that point. Hey, you know, I might be on a beach somewhere. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see. 
All right, that's that a good, honest answer. Anything else you want to get across about your tenure so far at CPD or your department that I didn't ask? You know what, uh, just uh, the pride that I feel, um, you know, being in charge of this department. Um, you know, one person at the, at the top of the department um, usually gets all of the credit, but all of that credit shouldn't come to me. There's an entire department, and we have some great people working within this department, great leadership uh, team that I'm slowly building, um, but the officers um, just responding um, in uh, just such a professional manner, especially during the DNC, uh, they show great restraint. And because of it, uh, they, they put Chicago in a different light. Um, the world got to see um, how great of a city Chicago is and how the Chicago Police Department got to keep it safe. Thank you for the time today. We appreciate it. Thank you.